Hey indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond. I'm Nick Bodmer, and on this week's episode, we take a Panasonic GH5 underwater. Plus, your questions about YouTube AdSense, editing log footage, and we have a gift, a free download to celebrate a podcast milestone. Hey Griffin, how are you, sir? I'm good. Happy 50th episode. Oh yeah, it is our 50th episode. In fact, that, later in the number. episode, we have a gift for everyone listening. A gift? An anniversary present. You get a car, and you <laughs> get a car. Like that? Yeah, pretty much like that. Just like in a just, just Very like close. Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> so on today's episode, we're going to talk about how we did some underwater shooting recently. We did. That was fun, wasn't it? It was fun, and I, I learned a lot, so we'll, we'll kind of share what we've learned. But real quick, I, I first want to talk about... What YouTube has done to creators. Okay. Have what you have heard they done? That, that doesn't sound good. That sounds <laughs> ominous. <laughs> it is. And people have been kind of worried about it. I, I've seen a lot of people commenting about this in the last week that YouTube has changed the rules of the partner program. Do you know what the partner program is? Is this in is? response to kind of all the controversy that's been stirred up with certain high profile YouTubers filming dead people and things like that? Yeah, it does feel like it's a direct response to Logan Paul his whole controversy uh but people are are saying that youtube is is harming they're taking it out on the smaller youtubers well i'm not really up to date on this so can you give me the uh the 30 second overview what, yeah, what so changes are happening to be a part of the partner program just means that you can make adsense dollars you can run ads against your video you make like you know you get like half the the ad revenue uh that youtube rec that youtube uh, generates but now, I mean, there are already some some requirements to be in that program, but now they've made it even harder. The new requirements are that you have to have a thousand subscribers. Wow, which is a pretty big hurdle already. But then so I think I should. I don't think I've signed up yet, and I, so I've probably lost my chance. Yeah, I think some people may be grandfathered in for six months or so. But uh, yeah, you may have lost any. Oh, chance. they're going to kick people out who didn't weren't there before. Or who had it already? Yeah, they're going to kick people out, I think, after a certain amount of time. I think you have wow. to clear the 1,000 subscriber threshold, which is already difficult. And then you also have to you have to achieve 4,000 watch hours annually. That's a lot of watch hours. Yeah. What is that? That's 4,000 times 60. It's 240,000 minutes you have to achieve every year. Do you know what what's your watch time? So I'm okay. I have <laughs> seventy thousand subscribers, so I, I clear that hurdle. Uh, and my watch time this year has been in the past calendar year has been six point three million watch minutes. Which, what? Which I divide that by sixty. It's a hundred and five thousand hours. That's a lot. So, so I'm about twenty five times over the watch time requirement. I'm about seventy times over the subscriber. Probably but, helps you have a long, rambling video podcast <laughs> yeah. to push up those minutes. <laughs> but that tells you that it's that the four thousand hours is a bigger hurdle for most people. I think that's harder to get to. And yeah. just, I did some math and figured that to really to get there, you would need in a year eight videos that are each three minutes long, with about ten thousand views each. That's what hmm. it'll take. That actually doesn't sound that unreasonable. Yeah, it's not it's not crazy. I mean, although I, I have to imagine that if you're below that, then your revenue would be so low as to almost not matter. Exactly. I had one friend who was complaining that he was being kicked off kind of jokingly. And he was like, and I've made 60 cents in the last year. So <laughs> <laughs> how dare you take away my 60 cents? So yeah, I mean, now, even are, you don't you don't make a big chunk of money from YouTube ads, right? No, I think my my YouTube AdSense revenue is like. Two hundred and fifty dollars a month, which sounds oh, wonderful. That's that's not nothing. Yeah, I mean it's it's a nice drop in the bank every month, but it's not enough to support the effort. That it's not paying me for my time to do it. Right. That's not why I'm right. doing it. It's almost just like a little bonus. Yeah, it's definitely. I can't make. I can't stop doing all my freelance jobs and just rely on YouTube revenue. Yep, makes sense. What but are the changes, at, or is that is that really it? That's really it. Um, but another thing to consider is that even, I think in my quick calculation, that eight videos, three minutes each, you need 10,000 views. That's assuming those 10,000 people watch the entire three-minute video, which is not going to happen. 
I looked right. at one of my more succinct popular videos recently, the hiding a mic in plain sight. Mm -hmm. It's 349 in length, and it, on average, gets people stick around for two and a half minutes. Maybe so I guess they're so watching boring. two thirds of it. But I think that's pretty normal. So, what was it before? I feel like I remember seeing that like once you had a video that had ten thousand views, you could get in. Because I was thinking like, oh, I think I could sign up for this, but I just don't care. Yeah, I think before it may have been something about lifetime views. I mean, they pretty much most of these these rules are to keep people from just like signing up really quick, being a spammer, stealing someone else's content, earning money off of it. And I actually think that's why this is a response to Logan Paul. I think after his video was taken down or demonetized, I think other people were re-uploading it and they just want to be able to stop new YouTubers from stealing someone else's controversial content, making a bunch of money off of it. Yeah, it makes sense. Because they were trying to take that video down and they were unsuccessful basically because it kept popping up and they couldn't control it. Yeah. I actually don't I can't even remember if they took it down or if they just were trying to demonetize it, but anyway, we all pay the price now. Okay, so what do you think? Should they... You're, so it sounds like you're kind of okay with the new rules? I mean, personally, I'm okay. Selfishly, I'm okay. But I don't think I'm okay with it from a community standpoint. It seemed really... Okay, you do... Yeah. Very harsh. Very harsh, yeah. Um, okay. So what can we again, do? How do we maybe rise it's, up? Maybe it's kind of a nice reminder to people that YouTube is not an easy place to make a living. You would have to be doing much better than that anyway. I'm at a place where... I'm allowed to make money off YouTube, but I'm not making enough that I'm living off of it. All right. Well, you want to talk about underwater video? Let's Something do it. Happier. <laughs> so, uh, first, we should set the scene. You and I were both in the Dominican Republic a few weeks ago. Uh, we were in in Punta Cana. Very what, nice. What brought us to this this lovely beachside spot? Well, 10 years ago, I went on my honeymoon. Uh, my wife and I, Kristen, got married in 2008, and we went to Punta Cana for our honeymoon. And so when the 10-year anniversary was rolling around, I said, hey, we should go back. And we talked with a couple of our pals and said, hey, who wants to come with? And you volunteered to, yeah. to, to attend with us. <laughs> How nice of me to it was. join you. I mean, I didn't pay for you to go or anything, right. but... <laughs> And then uh, tell tell our listeners and our viewers what I decided to bring with me. So I get a uh, I get a message from Griffin that says uh, I've got an underwater camera system, and he sends a picture of him in his bathroom holding what looks like a small robotic submarine or something. <laughs> it's just this crazy huge housing with these big lights on a on on top. Uh, it was very impressive, and I can't imagine traveling with it was very much fun. But it was very cool looking. So what was it? I don't even know what it was officially called. So, so yeah, this is uh, well, it, I this is B and H let me borrow some underwater equipment. I've been really curious recently about shooting underwater, and not just shooting underwater with like the GoPro or other cameras that I may have access to that can go underwater immediately. I want to be able to shoot with my GH five. I wanted to be able to use yeah. all the settings that I like on that camera, shoot video and 4K and vlog and all that. And uh, so I was wondering if there's a way to do that. And I found that one popular product is this Icelite housing. It's mm -hmm. called the Icelite 200DL underwater housing. And what's cool about it is, I mean, it, it, it's way bigger than I thought it'd be. You saw how giant this thing is. It's, it's really massive. thick. Uh, but what's cool is that all the buttons are mapped exactly to the GH5. I mean, I think they make the same housing for several camera bodies, but uh, it's mapped to the GH5. So just about every button, with the exception of maybe one or two, are accessible from the outside of this underwater rig. Yeah, it was impressive. The downside of it is that it's super expensive. Uh, I mean, maybe if you're into underwater photography, this doesn't seem super expensive to you, but the housing itself is $1,600, $95, $1,700. And, and then there was all kinds of accessories, right? 
Yeah, and that doesn't even get you underwater. That's just the housing, and then you need to put these. Uh, you need to put a dome port on the front, which is another three hundred and fifty dollars. You have to put an extension tube just to fit the the lens, and that's another two hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, so all in all, when I count the camera itself and the eight to eighteen millimeter lens that I put underwater with it, I also put in like a, a red color correction filter for underwater. All in all, just to get that stuff underwater uh it's sixty three hundred dollars worth of equipment oh jeez! actually that's also you're including gonna throw it in the ocean <laughs> that's also including the eight hundred dollar lights that i got as well i got the but it uh, was a nice setup right yeah it was fun to it's fun to play around with these lights i'm holding right now these are called sea dragon lights and they're they're underwater lights they throw out what i think it's like twenty five hundred um Wait, what's the measure of light that I'm thinking of and forgetting? Lumens. Lumens, yes. 2,500 lumens a piece. Uh, so they're pretty powerful. They were very bright. We used them outside of the water a little bit, and they're almost too bright, right? At night and dusk, dusk time, oh, yeah. they're, like, very bright. Well, one funny thing I learned about them is that they get so hot that they're only intended to use be used underwater. Uh, <laughs> they become the dangerously just... <laughs> warm uh, yeah. above <laughs> above water. Well, yeah, because one of my tests that I was doing just in my kitchen, like playing around with them, I was dropping them in water just to make sure, like, yes, they do work. Uh, and I think I, at one point, was holding one near my neck, and I think I burnt my neck a little bit on it. Jeez. And then we did use them out of the water a little bit, like to light your uh, on your anniversary night. We took that picture of you on the beach with Kristen. It was a very nice picture. And that Perhaps was lit. you can share it. With one of the uh, the sea dragon lights, but I was I was like, well, we can only use it for maybe a minute, and then it needs to turn off so it doesn't overheat. <laughs> it was a very fun trip. Thanks for joining me on it. Oh yeah. So let's see, what did we learn about shooting underwater? Is there anything you took away from it that surprised you? Well, we we played with it in the pool. I think that's where I got my most hands on. Uh, it's hard to tell what you're getting. You can't really see the screen as you're shooting you're kind of just pointing or did you find you were able to kind of actually in, look at it underwater i think in most lighting conditions i was able to see it pretty well but yeah occasionally the sun would be glaring and it was hard to see i mean you're looking through a piece of glass or whatever this plastic is on the back of the i'm just mean when i was actually underwater with it trying to hold my eyes oh, open underwater yeah i i could never see anything underwater so what we did was i think we had it on Maybe not high burst mode, maybe medium burst mode. And it was taking we, a lot of pictures. <laughs> we were mostly taking photos, and whenever we would try to do anything underwater, like Nick would pose underwater, or our friend Matt. Actually, I have a great shot of Matt where he was like sleeping on the bottom of the pool. <laughs> and we would just uh, just pull the trigger and just hold it for 30 seconds, and we'd get... I mean, I shot 1,100 photos in one pool session one afternoon. <laughs> But then we'd get we'd get the shot somewhere in there. Yeah. What about video? How much video did you shoot? Uh, I shot some video in when we were snorkeling, and mm -hmm. I shot it all in vlog, thinking I might want all, the ultimate ability to color correct it. And one thing I did was I learned that when you're diving, you're supposed to use a red filter on the front of the lens. And I know I had read this in some of the literature or descriptions of these things when I was I was looking at which one to buy I think they they are made for much deeper like I bought it thinking I was going to need it but I think because I was snorkeling and I was never diving more than a few feet underwater I just wasn't getting the terrible green blue color shift that needed to be corrected by red I think if you were going deeper you would need it so you actually ended up having to kind of color correct out the red a little bit? Yeah, pretty much. So it's probably good that I shot it in V-Log, but uh, I probably didn't need the, the red filter. I don't. Have I seen yet any final video from that underwater shoot? No, I'm still working on the, like, the tutorial video. In fact, this, this podcast episode is kind of like the preview of I'll make a much more concise video about all the equipment I used, everything I learned about how to take stuff underwater. And you also did a little GoPro comparison, right? Yeah, so my, my goal was to take the $6,300 worth of stuff underwater, see how that goes. That was a lot of fun to play with. But then I also wanted to know, is there a more economical way to do it? And so I also took a GoPro with two Lytra lights, which are these little 
lights that can go underwater. And that whole thing costs $600. And then I also tried a $40 option. Well, not $40 if you count the camera. But there's this little $40 bag called the Dica Pack. <laughs> and it just looks like a little Ziploc bag, but it has like Velcro on it. And it has a little a little opening that unscrews to fit your lens on. And I like the idea of it. Uh, it even has like a little finger hole that you can reach in and, and click the shutter and everything. But uh, in the end, it was just too hard to operate the camera. So I ended up just putting it in intelligent auto mode and just really just firing the shutter. Did you get decent results? Yeah, it was nice. You know, I, I didn't even do much underwater shooting with it. What I ended up using it most for was just when I wanted to take a camera... Uh, like you and I went, uh, we went on the the Hobie Cat, which is a tiny little sailboat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just like you know, a, a sail and some mesh to sit on. And that was a good use for the Dica, uh, the Dica Pack. So the thing's called Dica Pack. Yeah, uh, just because I could I could bring it out on top of the ocean and not worry about it splashing my camera. Uh, and I think I may have even tried throwing it underwater for a second. I mean, it's, it it definitely worked. But it's not very, it's Perfect. not as usable. And I probably should have gotten a bigger one. It kind of barely accommodated my GH5, and not all my lenses could fit. I had to use some of my smaller lenses. Did you get any epic footage of me sailing my boat? Oh yeah, I think I, I think I got some good photos and video. I felt like Captain Jack Sparrow for sure. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I found. That was strange to me, especially when we were shooting in the pool. The pool was a great chance to, to try things out. I, I feel like I was able to learn a little bit better. I probably should have spent more time in the pool uh, before we, we went in the ocean with it. But the one of the weird things that was happening, I was shooting half in, half out shots. And That's where the camera is see, looking underwater and above water at the same time? Yeah, and this is one thing that the, the expensive underwater housing can do well that, like, a GoPro can't do on its own and the Dica pack wouldn't be able to do on its own. It help it's helpful to have distance between the lens and the dome port, the the plexiglass or whatever it's made out of uh, dome on the front because then you can actually see the division of the water. You can see the line of the ocean above and below it. Whereas I think if that was on your lens, it just wouldn't look like anything. I don't think you'd be able to see that line very clearly. Unless you're shooting at like F-22 or something. Yeah, exactly. So that's where this dome port came in handy. And I'm trying to take advantage of that and shoot like half in, half under. So you could see people's feet underwater, but then you could see the trees above water. But I was noticing that what happens underwater is everything zooms in. Like just the effect of, what is that, refraction? Of all the diffraction? refraction something like, <laughs> something like that and then Diffraction. also you're getting different focus above and below water oh yeah yeah so most of the time i had it kind of on a, a 225 area autofocus for photos and sometimes i was getting the underwater in focus sometimes i was getting the above water part of my subject in focus sometimes i was getting the water on the dome port in focus like way in front of the the subject I think it is refraction, by the way. Refraction. So I feel like I still have, have some learning to do. In fact, I think I'm going to take this thing with me to Dubai next week. Oh, perfect. I'm going to be on the the uh, the Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf. So I should uh, go out there with it and see if I can get some cool shots. Now, I went scuba diving for the first time, but I could not convince you to join me and bring the whole setup. Yeah. Which was disappointing. <laughs> well, I wanted more time to, like, learn how to... Like, you, you're, this was your first time scuba diving, right? It was. And you would not have been al comfortable or maybe even allowed to take, like, the big rig with you, right? Yeah, I, I tease you, but... Uh, you, you're kind of learning how to not die when you're first scuba diving, so I think yeah. trying to n not die and operate a fancy camera like that would be a bad call. I do yeah. kind of wish I'd brought a GoPro with me or something that I could just like attach to my head or vest or something just yeah. to get a little bit of underwater footage, but uh, alas, I did not. I've seen 
there are even snorkels out there now that have GoPro mounts on the bottom of the snorkel. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because you would need some sort of like wrist strap or something to like, so you wouldn't wouldn't be it wouldn't be flopping around. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing some footage from uh, from that fun trip because uh, I'm sure. Yeah, I've been like great. keeping it away from you, saving it for my YouTube audience. <laughs> Eventually, I'll release <laughs> I was all like, of it. But it was my trip, <laughs> and I still just shoot. Um, I just shot some like B roll in my apartment, just some general um, uh, B roll of of the product. And and you saw, I think I shared it with you that I did like super slow mo in my kitchen. Oh, I did see that. That was crazy cool. Looked yeah, like I, you were making quite a mess, though. I decided I did. I decided that for like the normal product shots of these things, I should just drop everything into the sink. And just let it in 180 frames per second splash everywhere, and it looked pretty cool. It did look cool. Yeah. In the, so I think after I get back from this trip, I'll, I'll finish that video. But in the meantime, if you're curious about some of the products that I used, I'm, I've kept a list of it at griffinhammond.com slash underwater. So if you're curious about this underwater rig, you can find it there. Fancy. Is this the time when we get to go Oprah Winfrey style and you get a car and you get a car? Yeah, yeah, we have a present for all of you, our our loyal watchers and listeners of the Hey Film, the Hey Indie Filmmakers podcast. You know our friend Adam Ron? I do. He he stood in for me one week, did he not? Yeah, this was early in the podcast. I don't remember exactly which episode it was, but we talked about uh, we talked about taxes. I feel like it was like episode eight or something. It's early. Hey, and it's almost tax season again. Yeah. But uh, Adam is a good friend of mine. He's a, a filmmaker in Bloomington, Illinois. And actually, he might be in Normal, Illinois. But uh, he just made a we'll cool call video. It Bloomington Normal. Yeah. Blono, as we say. Blono. Where Nick and I both went to college. And Go Redbirds. Whoop. Adam just made a great tutorial video about how to make light leaks, DIY light leaks. Cool. Which you can do by really just taking your lens off your camera. You can let some light leak in. So he was playing around with that, and he went ahead and made 101 different video files, different forms of light leaks coming in, and he's gone ahead and just shared it with all of us. He was excited that our 50th episode was coming up, and so he gave me all the video files, and I'm sharing them with you. They're all on our website, our show notes at hey.film. So these are light leaks we can incorporate on top of existing video we shoot? Is that how it works? Yeah, they're just over black, so a really easy way to do it would just be using a luma keyer to knock out the black, or Adam shows you in the video that you can mess around with some different compositing techniques and uh, play around and see which one looks best on top of your video. But yeah, he uses them as transitions. You could use them as special effects. They're fun. Well, thank you, Adam. Very kind to share yeah. with the audience here on our 50th anniversary yeah it sounds weird to call it it sounds like we've been doing this for 50 years <laughs> 50 weeks 50 episodes because they're not really weekly but close right. to yeah should we answer some questions mr hammond let's do it our first email is from jeffrey who says hello griffin and nick love the show by the way i'm Thank curious you, you guys work together on the show but how does the pay ratio work out interesting question I guess. Uh, wait a minute. I, wait, there's money? <laughs> you I mean, didn't tell me about that part of it. That's not true. It's made money and I've paid it to you. I've paid you half it's of true. it. It's so, true. It's true. It, it's not like the show has made tons of money. I think um, the the podcast itself has, has made about $3,000 worth of revenue. And then we've spent like half of that on microphones and microphones the website and various various expenses very sundries so we can't say that it's been super profitable over the course of a year it has made a profit but not enough to pay us for the amount of effort that we put into it again we're no, we don't make the podcast for the, the fame yeah and riches. i mean that's really not why <laughs> why we're into it i mean it's nice a, a little bonus every once in a while sure but uh i i think we would do this uh even with no income coming in it's just fun to do it's yeah. fun to interact with people and then and talk about uh what we're interested in 
But Jeffrey's but in right general, to be concerned because I do control all the finances and you do. You I could be lying to you about how much it's made. Uh, and knowing you as well as I do, that is probably true because you are a dirty liar. I like to think that I've no, been, that's not true. That I'm super fair, and I've given you. I, I I probably don't even need to do the amount of accounting that I've done. You probably do not, <laughs> but it's always nice to know you have. And I think you know, uh, you, we basically, as far as I know, basically split it fifty fifty, like the sponsorship money. Which yeah. is probably like depends how you look at it. It's probably a little unfair to you since you bring the whole audience. So you, I mean, you do all the work and bring the audience, and I just come and talk for an hour. <laughs> but then I like to think that you're getting some value. Uh, you know, it's good content for your channel, which you can you can monetize in other ways as well. So right. that's yeah. how I look at it. Yeah, I think that that's a fair assessment. And le- to to relate it back to our conversation earlier about YouTube AdSense. The podcast makes some money through YouTube AdSense, but actually I think the most, the largest portion of what it does make in profit does come from sponsorships. Yeah. So thank you, sponsors. Yeah. Next question. (laughs) Do you want to read the email from Rick? Yes. Rick says, hey, Griffin, love the podcast. Discovered it about two months ago and then binge watched until I was caught up. Really appreciate you and Nick. Thank you. My wife and I will be traveling to Las Vegas in June for our 15th anniversary. Congratulations. And I'm looking at renting some glass for the trip. He's got a GH5, a 50mm adapted Leica, a 35mm toy macro, and a 35 to 70 adapted FD lens. Uh, he's looking at lens rentals. He's considering the 8 to 18 and the 12 to 35. He's going to take a day trip to the surrounding areas and would want to capture the landscape and scale of things. He's new to the Micro Four Thirds system. Uh, he's concerned about the variable aperture on the AT8, 8 to 18, but he, seem, he says you like it a lot. Would love to hear your thoughts and recommendations. Go. Yeah, I do like it a lot. Um, the AT18, I think, is an amazing outdoor lens. It's a great... I was just going to say, for landscapes, I think that AT18 is definitely the way to go. Yeah, and I wouldn't worry about the variable aperture. The It's a f2.8 when it's at 8 millimeters. It's f4 when it's at 18 but if you're shooting outside, you're usually getting plenty of sun, so that's why it's so good. Um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't necessarily. What about use it nighttime? Like if you, if they're on the strip in Las Vegas and they want to get all the glitzy lights, is that eight to eighteen going to work, or is that going to cause some I mean, problems? Even at even on the strip, I mean, you live in Vegas; it's pretty bright, it's right? A lot of light, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like it's that's not really like you're shooting at night, uh, so I think it'd be okay. The eight to eighteen though is a weird focal length for people. You'll look very distorted. It's kind of a fun selfie lens, but make sure to put yourself in the center of the frame, or otherwise you're going to make yourself kind of distorted. Um, but it's great for capturing, yeah, especially for Vegas, capturing the strip, capturing the environment around you. Uh, you just may want something a little tighter for portraits to, that are a Which little bit more got. flattering. Which he's got. He's got a 50 millimeter for yeah. portraits. He's got the 35 to 70. That 35 is a great little portrait lens, I'm guessing. Yeah. So As I much think, as I uh, love, I he also mentions wide. the... He mentions the 12 to 35, which you and I both have and is an amazing lens. Yeah, that's what I'm shooting on right now. I love it, but if you, if I had to pick that between the two. That extra four millimeters makes a big difference in landscape photography, I feel like. Yeah, I've really started traveling with the 8 to 18 over the 12 to 35 for travel stuff, just because I know I'm going to want to get the widest possible time lapses and exterior shots I can. It's a fun lens. And uh, lots of good stuff, you know, around Vegas to go shoot landscapes. We've got Red Rock, we've got Valley of Fire, we've got Hoover Dam, we've got Lake Mead. So lots of opportunities. Yeah. Here's an email that I received from Dan. He's wondering how I controlled my movement in, I think he's specifically talking about the behind the scenes video that I shot of Mystery Box shooting with the Mm -hmm. GH5S. We talked about this last week. And he was wondering, I have some beautiful motion in that, and he had seen my creative live class where I was using some pretty DIY techniques for movement, like putting my camera on a conveyor belt. I've done that a few times. And I put it on like a hand cart as well. It just uses a cheap, free dolly that was there in the in the environment. So he's wondering, how the heck did I get such a beautiful movement in this behind-the-scenes video? You cheated, didn't you? It's it's not in body image stabilization, as he's wondering. You know what I used, right? It's the gimbal. It's yeah. your uh, funny name I can't say, gimbal. The Zeeuwen Tech uh, crane the 
Yeah, the Zeo and Tech Crane, which I've been enjoying using. Which we using. talked about maybe three or four episodes ago, right? You talked yeah. about how it broke and you had to buy another one while you're on a trip. Yeah. Yeah, the first one broke on me, but uh, the replacement one has been doing just fine. And I've, I, I, I don't always need a gimbal. It's not always my preferred way to shoot. It's, it's more gear to bring with me. But for the last few projects I've been working on, I've been worried about the amount of B-roll I'd be able to capture in a short period of time. And it just gives me the peace of mind that everything I shoot on the gimbal is going to be smooth and I can shoot for five solid seconds and I could use all of it. I don't need to just cut really quickly like I normally do. All right, we got a tweet from Nicholas A. After hearing the most recent Hey Film podcast yesterday, I want to ask you and Nick about discussing how you edit color profile vlog from the gh5 in final cut pro 10 do you have a specific workflow and you haven't shot vlog because that's probably not available on your can't do it on the gh5 plus i'm lazy so it seems (laughs) unlikely that i would even if i could well it's funny because i had vlog ever since i had my gh4 like we must be going on four years now since that camera came out and i had it played around a little bit but then just ultimately never really used it because i didn't i wasn't very comfortable with the workflow Luckily, now that I have G- the I have Vlog again on my GH5s, it's a little bit easier now with Final Cut Pro 10 because they've added LUTs into the settings area. If you go to the info tab on a clip, you can go down to settings and turn on a LUT. And there's even a built-in one called Panasonic Vlog and it does a pretty good job. Nice. In fact, I should share the one that I like using now. I can't remember exactly the provider of this LUT. So I'll put it in the show notes at hey.film. But it's this one that's intended to turn log footage. It's it's intended to match it with fairy cam footage. Okay. And I tend to just like the way it looks. So I've been using that a lot, just taking my vlog footage, kind of converting it to a very cam look. And then I'll usually color correct from there. But it's a great starting point. It looks pretty good on its own. So w- are you shooting do. vlog basically all the time now? Uh, I am a lot, yeah, a lot more than I used to be. Um, pretty much all the projects, not the behind-the-scenes projects that I shot recently for Panasonic, but uh, the projects that I'm shooting recently for for other clients, I've been shooting in Vlog. I guess I've been playing around with it on shorter projects where I know that I, I will have the time to do all the color correction in case I really screw this up. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather not do it on a giant project where I'm not yet comfortable with it. Here's a YouTube comment we got from Daniel Elmore, who says he got some money for Christmas, and he's trying to figure out what equipment he might buy to enhance the quality of his films. So he currently has lighting basics, sound, lenses, and editing software. So he's wondering if there's anything, you know, what's next that he should invest in? Uh, First thing comes to my mind is stabilization, right? A good tripod, or if he already has that, a, a gimbal or something like that, I think can really enhance um what you're doing yeah i'm hoping at this point think? he already has a, a tripod because i mean he left that out of the list but that that would be definitely But i'm talking about a good tripod i mean yeah. you know the difference when you move from like a crappy tripod to a really good fluid head that's yeah. what i'm talking about yeah yeah you definitely need a tripod i mean gim everyone loves gimbals and i have one now but i can't say that that's very high on my list of things you need unless you're doing a lot of weddings or something good mic Yep. Audio gear. Pedco Ultra Clamp. Like 10 of them. <laughs> you just got another one I saw. I did. Yeah, I just, uh, there's three things I just bought. I bought a ped, a new Pedco Ultra Clamp. Uh, actually, I should tell you why I've, I've done it. I realized after, wait, we're on episode 50 now. I realized it was getting pretty annoying to set up lights every time we did the podcast then tear them down every time we're finished with the podcast and I have to you know I have to take them to a shoot and then I have to bring them back and set it back up for the podcast so I I realized I should set up some permanent lighting for this podcast and I happen to have these LED lights called specular I think I've mentioned them before okay I don't remember they're they're, they're this modular system uh, specular uh, I have like two of them and they come with like four LED panels each and you can make them into any shape you want. So for this episode, I've gone ahead and just mashed four of them together to make 
part kind of a, a square panel. And I've used a Pedco Ultra Clamp. I bought an extra one so I could just leave this one there. I've actually mounted it inside my shelf, like in, inside my closet oh. on a shelf. So Brilliant. So you close the, shell, the closet yeah. and it's gone and open it up and you're ready to shoot. Right. And it's there ready to go every week. The, the only thing I needed was I got the Pedco Ultra Clamp and then I also bought some CTO gels gels that turn the color temperature more orange Mm -hmm. and uh because these ones these are pretty blue i think their color is like maybe it's 5600 kelvin and i wanted something a little bit more yellow so i think i've put a quarter cto gel on one and i put an eighth cto gel on the the one in the back but now i think i can just kind of leave these in place brilliant yeah. So you're saying when I when I'm ready to record the podcast, you're going to be ready faster. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and my last little purchase was a uh, uh, a piece of it's just it's it's travel gaffer tape. It's called micro gaffer. I saw those. Those look cool. <laughs> I should also put this in the show notes. These things that I'm talking about right now. So at Hey Dot Film, you can find this travel gaffer tape because for years I've been using the same giant gaffer tape i don't need very much of it but i have to throw the whole thing in my suitcase when i travel because i might need some tape sometimes i don't have all the right adapters for my uh for my i don't have all my step up adapters for my lenses and filters so sometimes i just tape a filter on and uh, it just seems stupid you seem to do that a lot (laughs) yeah i do do that a lot and so finally i had the i don't know why i didn't have this idea much sooner to buy some really small gaffer tape uh, so i could more easily travel with it gotta love gaff tape yeah so i will be taking that to dubai next week that's exciting in fact this trip almost didn't happen because i don't know the government shut down yeah (laughs) i didn't even think about it as i was very carefully following the news that the government had shut down i did not even think about the fact that my state department sponsored trip to the middle east would be affected because all those people at the State Department would not go to work. <laughs> if, so what did you hear? They basically said, hey, FYI, if we're not back up and running, you're not coming? Well, I was watching this very closely on Monday, and luckily the you know, Congress signed a resolution to keep government open for three weeks, and then we'll have, you know, they'll deal with this again. But I was waiting for Donald Trump to sign it so that I would know that, okay, I can go. I can still go. <laughs> And it's done now? Good to go? Yeah, it looks like I'm good to go. We'll see. Hopefully it didn't create any impact on the trip for me. All right. Well, that'll be exciting. Yeah. So again, if uh, like I mentioned last week, if you happen to be in the United Arab Emirates and would like to meet up, I will be there for the next week. So uh, email me at griffin at hey.film and let me know. That's all I got. Brilliant. Well, we're wrapping it up then. Is that right? Yeah. Let's get out of here. Travel safe, my friend. And we will uh, talk to you all next week. Yeah, from next week Dubai. I guess we'll actually do the podcast from... Uh, either I'll be in Dubai or Abu Dhabi. I don't know exactly what day. But... We'll find out. Yeah. I'll see you then. Tune in next week to find out. <laughs> Thanks for watching. All right, my friend. Everyone. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. griffinhammond.com slash underwater let's take a look shall we uh huh doesn't look like you put it up yet oh no i didn't (laughs) (laughs) because you guys are watching this in the future you see (laughs)